Um, so we were going to start with Bev. So we'll begin with uh, Aiden instead. So Aiden, this first question is to you. And okay. just to ask you, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about Spectrum? So just what Spectrum is and why, what was the thinking behind creating such a fellowship? Why, uh, why was it needed? Basically. Yeah, so um, Spectrum's been running for about three and a half years now. Um, I wasn't one of the founding members um, that kind of set it up, but um, I did, I've been to nearly every single one. Um, so it's a group that meets once a week in Belfast, or sorry, once a month in Belfast. Um, and the whole purpose of it being set up, we are specifically an LGBT plus Christian fellowship. Like there's, you know, we are, you know, what we say we are. Um, and it was really set up just because in Northern Ireland particularly, um, there was nowhere that was very vocal and very obvious um, for LGBT Christians to go to. Um, whether that was people who, like myself, were brought up in the church and then have came out and have either been told to leave, been, have felt they can't keep going to church, um, or people who are LGBT and just want to see what this whole faith thing's about. But know that they've somewhere they can come where nobody's going to judge them nobody they can walk in the door with their friends and their family or on their own and nobody's gonna judge them nobody's gonna say well if you're lgbt then well there's the door go straight back out where you are um so it was really set up just there wasn't anything like that so it was the kind of thing of well if it isn't there right well let's just create it ourselves you know who'll know better how to create a space than ourselves and um, so we've been going for like three and a half years now. Um, we've been very lucky that we have a Methodist Church, South Belfast. Methodists on Lisburn Road have let us use um, their sanctuary and all their facilities um, to have our meetings. Amazing. I, I think you had something like 90 or 100 people at your first opening meeting. And I remember reading yeah. about Spectrum and when it was first being launched. And at the time, Harbour, as a church in Carrick, uh, although we thought of ourselves as welcoming, we, we hadn't really been uh, open about that or consciously, you know, stated that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually seeing you guys watching Spectrum and realizing, oh, hold on, there's a whole group of Christians here who, who don't know that they're going to have a non-judgmental welcome at a church so much so that they've had to feel the need to create a separate community. Some, something struck me as oh, that doesn't feel right. And actually that was one of our motivations for making sure that there was at least somewhere saying, look, there's, there's, there's a welcome here. You, yeah. you, can, you guys have done a fantastic job in spurring on churches like us to, to do more and to do better. And um, so thank you so much um, for sharing that, Aiden. Just one other question. Yep. From your experience uh, over the last however many years, is there anything in particular you think the wider church could learn um, from Spectrum, the way it operates, the experiences you've had, the stories you've heard? I mean, it was, if there was one or two things you think we could, the wider church could learn, what would you say those are? Um, yeah, so you mentioned stories. Um, one of the things we do at Spectrum quite a lot is we basically provide the space for LGBT people who want to share their stories to share them. Um, because most often that has such a big impact. Um, for the wider church, you know, give us the opportunity to speak and share our stories because, you know, unless we're given that space, our voices aren't going to be heard. Um, and it means a lot to us as well to be told, yeah, you can come up here and you can share about your experience and not have to hide the fact that, you know, you're gay or you're trans or whatever. You can just be totally honest. Um, and also for the wider church, just to... Um, you know, as I was saying, just create a space where somebody can walk in and it's not where a church might say, oh yes, we're affirming, which means you can come in the door, but you have to sit at the back and you can't be involved in leadership and you can't do, you know, you can't be up the front doing music if you're gifted with music or you can't be involved in stuff like that. So and I know churches struggle with that. You know, they struggle with, you know, how you know inclusive can we be and trying to stay true to their interpretations of the scriptures. Um, but the main thing would be just, you know, make us welcome, you know, make it obvious that we're welcome and give us a platform to speak. Because um, there's so many amazing stories. I mean, you guys at Harbour have given me the opportunity to share my story um, along with others and even being able to just 
speak about that with a room full of people with anybody um gives a lot of freedom really amazing thanks aiden it's it's strange to hear you say i don't i know it's true your challenge to the church there to make it obvious that you're welcome mm -hmm. this is what i heard you say and that's that was something that's really crucial and i agree with you i think more of us need to hear that it's okay thinking that you're welcome but you have we have to make that obvious you wouldn't think we have to make it obvious but we do um you think it'd be natural for christian church to behave in a non-judgmental way but that isn't always the case so um thank you thank you so much aiden jade and sarah both of you um work in areas uh, where you have many sensitive and confidential conversations uh, with people of faith who are perhaps struggling with those intersections between their faith and their sexuality and they're still private about it. They, they haven't come out perhaps. Um, and these are conversations that most church ministers, pastors, leaders probably aren't even aware are happening, let alone what the content of those conversations are. What do you wish, and maybe, maybe Sarah, I'll begin with you. What do you wish that other church leaders could hear, really hear from those conversations that they're not hearing, right? What, what, what message do you think church leaders need to pick up on based on your conversations uh, that you've had? And also, Sarah, you can perhaps begin just by explaining what Open Table is and how it is you come to have those conversations in the first place. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, so hello everyone. Um, so Open Table is essentially a group of worship communities, so welcoming and affirming churches um, around kind of England and Wales in particular um, are willing to hire um, to kind of set up a community within their church for aimed at LGBT people um, and so um, we've kind of set up lots of different communities where people can come and feel like they can get a warm welcome um, by going to that church. So that's, that's in a nutshell, kind of what we do. I think in preparing for that, that question, I think I would totally agree with Aidan. I think, you know, being able to tell your story is really, um, is a really amazing thing to be able to do. And I've got a couple of other things, but just a kind of quick anecdote. I, I remember the first time I wanted to tell my story in, in the church that I'm, um, I go to, I attend a cathedral in um, at the cathedral in Ripon um, in Yorkshire. And uh, I was at a kind of a group they were running for uh, on the kind of subject of same sex relationships. And I wanted to tell my story. I was so desperate to tell my story, but I was so nervous to kind of um, to tell my story. And I, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to, whether I was allowed to or not. And I remember um, the kind of pastor person, the person who um, kind of was leading the group, wandered out to go to their kitchen. I chased after them going, am I allowed to tell my story? Just like, you know, it's kind of, you, you really do need that, that permission because sometimes you feel like if I tell that, is that going to cause a problem? Is that going to be difficult? Um, so I would, I would totally agree with that. I think just a couple of other things. I think um, just listening to people, I know that sounds like such a tiny thing, but actually really listening to people's experience without that kind of judgmental but thing, but just, just really deeply making people feel like you've actually heard what they're saying, I think is, is really significant. Um, but when one of the, and there's so many things, but one of the other things I think is, is also really important is to have that attitude that when you're speaking to people that you don't immediately go into fix mode, that I'm going to try and fix the person that I'm talking to in some kind of way. Um, because probably, you know, well, I don't know if I'm a, a good example um, particularly, but certainly kind of from a very young age, I knew that I was trans and, and grew up knowing that. And actually, I guess the, the, the tape that was going in my head to myself was, you need to be fixed. So actually, when I went to the church and said, I'm trans, I'm, I don't know what, what to do, I don't know, there, they immediately said, well, we can help you to be fixed. And that was kind of the immediate reaction. And I think, I suspect that's probably a lot of people's kind of experience. And I think um, putting people into a position where actually, you, you know, it, it wasn't really until much later in life that I kind of encountered Christians who even floated the idea with me that actually I didn't necessarily need to be fixed, that actually I was kind of okay as I was. Um, and, but that wasn't until my probably 30s or early 40s. Um, and so it took a very long time to kind of um, to get there. So I think just hearing, listening to people and letting them kind of not feel like you're there to try and change them, but you're there to accept um, who, what, what they're kind of saying and who they are as a person is, would be amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Jade, similar sort of question from your experience. And also just for those who don't know, just take a moment to explain 
what Diverse Church is? Sure. Uh, what an absolute joy to be having this conversation and such wisdom from Aidan and Sarah, of course. Uh, my heart's agreeing wholeheartedly with everything that you're saying. Um, Diverse Church, for those of you who don't know, is a charity and we establish online in the first instance communities um, and I, I feel that that's really really important because there's something about the accessibility for people who aren't out for all sorts of reasons and um, the idea that this is a community that you can access from anywhere at any time feels really important and certainly has been for lots of people who have joined um, and the idea is that for people who um, perhaps feel like God has given up on them or they feel like they have to give up on God or make some sort of a choice between faith, sexuality, gender identity. This is a space to join and just flourish, flourish in who you are and be celebrated entirely for who you are um, and be able to connect or reconnect with faith in refreshing and celebrative ways. Um, we also have a parents group for young people uh, who are LGBTQ+, um, which is just fabulous as well. So yeah, there's lots of information on the website and on Twitter and on Facebook if you want to find out any more about it. Um, in relation to your question then, Steve, about the conversations that are happening, um, yeah, so whenever people join Diverse Church, we would hear stories of, um, I can't believe that this exists. And the wonderful thing is it doesn't only exist in diverse church, it exists in, in other ways as well as we're hearing right now. And that is encouraging and may more and more and more of those exist. Um, but people are still saying, I, I can't believe that this exists and that I can utter the words of who I am. Um, and that I can utter the words of who I am in the context of faith and maybe even receive something of an affirming God in that. Uh, we hear stories of people being told that they are a problem, as Sarah has said, that people are told that there are demons in them, that they are told that they are sinful, that they must seek out um, so-called therapy to change, that if they don't do that, they at the very least must place their every move um, in order to exist within the church. And um, so, you know, they can't find love in their life and they have to suppress a major part of their identity in order to exist within the church. Um, a lot of people as well will say that the church has either said nothing or has said enough for them to truly believe that they can't be open about who they are within their church. So they live in this tension of, of pain and uh, unpredictability, you know, um, or perhaps too much predictability, actually. If I let people in on who I am, it's, it's not going to be a positive thing. I'm not going to get a good reaction. So those are the kinds of conversations that we're hearing all the time in Diverse Church. There are really positive stories too, which I know we'll come to later. Um, but I just think it's important to name those things because I actually think that there are a lot of church leaders who are extremely well-intentioned, mm. but who are contributing to the feelings that people are having of not being enough and not being accepted. Yeah, that, that, that's what my question was getting at. And do, do you think that those church leaders, by and large, are aware of the impact their words are having? Um, or do you think they're completely oblivious? Um, I think it's so much more than that binary, isn't it? Mm. that uh, I think that there are a lot of church leaders who um, sit in a space of ignorance because of their refusal to create space to actively listen. Mm -hmm. um, and they can also be well-intentioned. They can also be very pastorally caring, um, but it's not extending in the way that it should to LGBTQ plus people. Um, I also do think that there are church leaders who are trying to control the narrative around this um, and actually quite often as Aidan said there are people who are not LGBTQ plus themselves or have no direct experience really of that in a personal way um, and that to me you know that that voice should not be central 
the voice that should be central are people who have the experience themselves. So I think it's a mixture. I think there are some people who know exactly what they're doing. I think there are an awful lot of people who actually genuinely don't and would probably be heartbroken to know the impact of their words, but they also do have opportunities to listen and to learn that they're potentially not taking. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a quick question to the, to the attendees. There's, a, there's about 50 attendees currently watching us. Um, by show of hands, and there's a little show, there's a raise your hand button. If you haven't seen it, it should be there on your screen. And no one else can see if you've raised your hand or not, by the way, uh, only I can. So by show of hands, just um, as, a, as a quick straw poll, could you raise your hand if you've ever, or someone in your family has ever felt unwelcomed because of your sexuality. So by, if you've ever felt unwelcomed or someone in your family has been made to feel unwelcomed in a church or in any faith context because of your sexuality or your gender, please just go ahead and raise your hand so I can have a, just a quick straw poll, just so we can tell. Okay. And it's almost a case of whose hand isn't up right now. So just, you, you can't see the hands, but I can. And um, wow, so that shows you at least 60, 70% of people on this webinar would agree with what you guys are saying. That's, that's been their experience. Okay. Um, the hands are still going up. So people are just finding the button, I think. <laughs> so, um, okay guys, if you go ahead and clear your hands so that, so that they're clear again for the next question we come to ask. In the meantime, David, question for you now. Mm -hmm. um, David, could you, if, if you don't mind, would you just describe your own experience uh, of coming to terms with your faith and your sexuality. What was helpful for you whilst you went through that and, and what wasn't? Um, in as much as you're willing to talk about your own personal journey, it, it might be helpful for, for some of us to hear some of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I just want to say thank you for having me here as well. It's a privilege to be in the same conversation as Jade, Sarah and Aidan. And um, it's been great to hear these things so far and great to hear about these organizations that are coming through that really are being such a welcoming place is wonderful. Um, that wasn't my background when to answer your question in uh, growing up. Uh, like um, many of us, I existed in that inherited space of the faith and worldview that had been sort of handed down from the generation before, um, one that was very clearly um, where well, the perceived wisdom was that relationships between people of the same sex was not the right order of things and was therefore wrong. Um, I also grew up in a space where I didn't know anyone who was openly um, LGBT as well um, within my close friends or family or anyone visible within the within the church and that really created an atmosphere of um that this wasn't something that was right it's not something that's talked about so that, can i ask david what what sort of age did you were you talking about here that so this is right from when i was um a child growing up in that environment when oh. i became i i, I grew up within um a within a church background and i think it is really important to say that there were so many positives from that and so much that i loved about the teaching from the church i got and interestingly enough on the idea of acceptance of people of the outside it's it's a such a core tenant to a lot of christian thought that it, it made a big part of my upbringing too but when it came to this issue it, that, it suddenly fell away and when I became a teenager and realized fairly early on that I fitted into that group of um, having attraction towards other guys that it became this disconnect with what, what I was learning from from this faith when you grow up in an environment where something is not talked about at all or even when the topic is raised, people bristle. I don't know if anyone's had that experience where a youth leader or a church leader actively bristles when the topic's raised because they're possibly so afraid to say something that might be either offensive or 
that they just want to avoid it. And so you, you know, and kids and young people learn so well to pick up on those social cues and to start learning to avoid it. So when I realized that I was gay myself, I had learned to hide that because this was something that was not acceptable. Um, and it didn't require too much to be said. A background of negativity and a lot of silence will do that. So mm -hmm. for the best part of um, a decade, my experience of faith and sexuality was that they are not compatible and it's something that should be hidden. Um, now, I suppose what's, what was interesting was then when that sort of flipped and that's um, something I can talk about as well, which is that um, when it got for me to a crisis point um, and needing to start to tell someone about this, living too long, feeling rejection, um, that I started to tell people about it. And that was a very painful process. Um, but overall, a very fulfilling one in the end. And through that journey and through the encounters I had with, with faith, with people of faith, with different groups, um, I think I grew a lot in faith more so than anything up to that, up to that point. Um, and the whole, you know, the title of this seminar being Taking Pride in Faith, I could probably now say that I could have that where I hadn't, didn't before, but it definitely was a very long road mm -hmm. to get to that, to get to that point. Um, and it's, when it comes to this issue, people have had similar experiences. And I, I know from being in um, conversation with different people, it's not an uncommon experience that you do have to push so much it's you're not starting from the same page when you have when everything is going against you to be welcoming it's not enough to say this is something that can be tolerated because you're already coming from an atmosphere where you've made people feel rejected and wrong and wrong in themselves and when you're in that stage you have to do a lot of work to make someone feel really welcome uh, and that's something that I've definitely learned and um, experienced as well. Um, and um, I'm really grateful to be in the, the role that I have within the Harbour Faith community. Um, this place, you know, hosts things like this, which is wonderful. And I've always found that to be a genuinely welcoming space. And that's such a wonderful thing. It shouldn't be such a wonderful thing. It should be what all Christian churches are known for. We're not yes. there yet. But yes. from hearing some of these other um, things that about diverse church, open table, and spectrum, you know, things are things are changing, and that's and that's great. Just to confirm something you were saying, there's mm. I, conversations I sometimes have with other church leaders. They say, "Yeah, look, we are open and affirming and welcoming, but we just don't feel the need to say so, um, because you know we don't say that we're." affirming of this person or that person. So if they are, their argument is that if we specify we're specifically LGBT affirming, well, then we would have to specify every other group of people too. And it's, it's, a, it's a bit like they're missing the point um, of what you're saying there, that we do need to work harder at, at showing our inclusiveness and, and affirmingness because of the history of the negativity that's gone before. And there's no way around that, you know, from, from what I hear you saying. Um, would, would, would the rest of the panel agree with that, that it's, it's, you, you have, with what David said there, churches need to work hard and conscientiously and deliberately to say if they are going to be completely in, you know, welcoming and affirming with no barriers, no lines, that they need to say so? Yeah. yeah think, I'll, you, you go ahead, Sarah. Sure. Um, yeah, so I would, I would totally agree with that. And I think... Um, and I also kind of would respect, I think, churches who were honest about not feeling like that. I'd rather kind of go somewhere and feel like, actually, if they weren't going to welcome me, that they'd be upfront about that rather yes. than kind of hiding that, hiding that away. Um, the other thing that was a little bit of a personal bugbear, so apologies if this is my own kind of issue, but when I started um, about three years ago, I, was, I transitioned and I was looking for uh, a church to join and I scoured loads and loads and loads of different websites to try and find 
who was, and I used some of the kind of the mm. inclusive church type websites as well. Um, but the thing that really frustrated me was a lot of the sites I looked at, they had kind of the word inclusive plastered kind of all over them. Um, and I, I was really like, wow, maybe I could go, that looks like a really great church. And then I'd read in the small print that actually what they really meant was they welcomed no noisy children or something else. It was kind of, they meant something completely different by the word inclusive. And I thought, I wasn't sure whether they were being disingenuous or kind of, you know, they, or they were trying to pretend to be something they weren't. But I think just being honest about it, because at least then you can kind of make a decision mm. around actually, do I do I want to be in this church so much that I'm willing to put up with that? Or mm. actually, do I kind of want to just go and find somewhere else to be? Yeah, and if I could just add to that as well, um, I, I think that privilege doesn't recognise itself. So to be able to say, you know, we, we are affirming or we think we're affirming, but we just don't feel the need to say so is a statement that comes from a place of privilege that is not recognising itself. Um, and the importance of actually tying your colours to the mast, because too often, I completely agree with Sarah, that if a church feels that, that they can't go there for whatever reason, say so. Don't do the, the kind of balancing act of we're welcoming and we really care about you and we love you, but, because that but is extremely damaging. Um, and what we're seeing all the time would be maybe... Uh, young people particularly, um, but all people who are embedded within their church communities, it is as important to them, even more important to them sometimes than their families. Um, and they are giving so much of themselves to that community. And then they feel safe, they feel welcome, they feel loved, so they come out and then everything changes for them. All of a sudden, as if overnight, they are a topic to be discussed and scrutinized. Mm. They are asked to step down from all sorts of positions. Mm. Um, and actually, like that is just so damaging. So yes, it is in incredibly important that it is named. Um, and I would say, you know, the hard work, there are other, there are intersections here that need to be named as well. Um, so actually it's really important. And um, sometimes it can feel a bit like, and we're inclusive of, or we're affirming of, or we celebrate and this group, and this group, and this group. But that is actually important because if people have been oppressed, they default to, I'm not celebrated here, and they need to be told that they are. Mm. Yeah. One thing that I like love about Harbour in particular is when you go in to the church building, it has what's sometimes called a cathedral welcome at the front. And it very much does go down a list of, you are welcome, if you are gay, you are welcome. If you are trans, you're welcome. If you are old, if you are young, you are welcome. If you have accidentally come in from the rain, you are welcome. If you are agnostic, you are welcome. If you're from another faith, it's... And I think it is important to, to, to name that and to um, be specific about that. Um, in Harbour in general, I suppose one thing that makes it different from these... Um, other groups that we're talking about that are so important is Harbour is a church that's trying to do this. It's not, it wasn't set up at all to be LGBT inclusive. That wasn't its um, mantra. It's, it's been evolving over time and opening the question and having these discussions and allowing people to be who they are in that space. And I think it's creating that. That is something that I find so yeah. important to those to spaces that can do that to allow people yeah. to be as they are instead of change and i think it's also might be helpful if any church leaders happen to be watching first of all that, that you do see as you can see from our panelists how important it is to say and the word i think that's most helpful is the word affirming rather than welcoming because that really sends the signal but whatever it takes make it clear but secondly to say you don't have to then change everything about the church. You know, I think some people think, well, if we're going to say we're LGBT affirming, then also we have to have all, all this political correctness language and we need to be hipster and we've got to be this. And, but we're really just a Baptist church, you know, and no one's saying that all of, all of your um, practices. And I mean, if you're a high Anglican church, that's fine. Just be a, an affirming one. If you're more of a Pentecostal church, that's fine. Just be an affirming one. It's, it's just one step to say we're all in this together and no one's excluded on any of those grounds at all in leadership and anything, and then see how your community evolves 
when those people who've previously felt unwelcome feel welcome and start to join you. Because that's been our experience. And we are never the same. No church is the same whenever new people join. Obviously, they take on the characteristics of those people. That's what a church does. That's how a community works. And as long as you're open to that, it's a great, great journey. And so, so try not to be afraid um, of, of what all that means. And yeah, definitely be, be clear. Um, but also don't, don't, don't be scared. Um, just some advice from me for what it's worth. Um, can, I, can I also say, I think there's something about that kind of public declaration from the front, front that is actually really significant. Hmm. I know that when I first, you know, the church that I'm, I'm at, when I joined them, um, they kind of, they very much affirmed me in, um, you know, in the meetings I had with them, in, you know, in conversations with the clergy, with the leadership. But I still went for the kind of first year or so, not really sure that it was never kind of said explicitly from the front. And I think I went for a kind of a good year or so where actually I was, this is really kind of, um, it was quite difficult at the time because I, I, I felt like, actually, do they really mean that? I'm not sure they really mean that. Yeah. Um, and actually, I was there were certain services where, you know, actually the, the cathedral had a very public face to the city. And I knew that they would be incredibly well attended. That almost I felt like I don't want to go because I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to be wow. seen in, in that kind of way. Um, and that was really difficult to kind of um, to go to those, those services and feel like I needed to exclu- exclude myself because actually it hadn't been explicitly said in that way. And so... The, the power in kind of really being very, very clear about it is, is so, so important, I think. Thank you, Sarah. Um, a, a question has come in here and uh, it basically is on the line of what we're talking about. And Alison asks, what practical things can a church do that makes it obvious that LG, LGBT people are welcome? So actually I'm going to, at this point, uh, Mary, if you're watching and you're one of our attendees, could you just raise your hand so that I can see you at the top of the list? And for those who don't know, Mary is part of the, the uh, Select Vestry, is that the right word, at uh, St. Gall's in, um, near Bangor. Oh, there you are, Mary, I see you. So I'm going to make Mary a panelist now. So uh, get your mic ready, Mary, because you're about to join us on the screen. There, here she comes. Oh, did I promote the wrong person? Alison, Alison Craig, I didn't mean to promote you to panelist if that's the wrong person or maybe you're using a different name. Hold on a second. Ah, Mary. Okay, Alison, I promoted you by accident because you were the one who asked the question. Luckily, your camera wasn't on, so we didn't see you, but you're, you're gone now. Mary, are you there? Yes, I'm here, but um, okay. where's my camera? Um, oh, yes. Alice, you. There you are. Okay, so just, just to explain hey, to, to folks, just to explain to folks why I've brought Mary on. Um, Mary is, is on the vest, select vestry of, uh, is that the right word, select vestry? Well, I'm People's Church Warden, actually. Oh, okay, People's Church Warden. <laughs> Uh, of St. Gauls. And so the question we were just asked was, how, how does a church make it obvious that it is LGBT affirming and welcoming? And you have a, your church this, just earlier this year did exactly that. And I'm wondering, maybe you just describe your experience and what was the thinking behind that, what happened earlier this year? I think it was January. Um, I can't remember. Oh, you know, that, you know, that was just a celebration. You know, yes. we, went, we actually became an affirming church um, last September. Okay. Okay. And so, I mean, I, I'm an ex-Presbyterian and um, I was church hopping and I sat in um, St. Gauls. I went into St. Gauls and just as soon as I sat down, Michael Parker, the rector, came and spoke to me and um, and. And, you know, it has been said of Michael that he is an exceptional priest. And I have found that. And so um, he, um, I went, I was there and they knew, they knew that my my son Kevin was gay, is gay. And so I said, uh, they were coming over for Christmas, uh, Louis and uh, Kevin and Louis' partner. And I said to to Michael, um, Kevin and Louis are coming for Christmas. 
I'm going to come out of church at Christmas. And so he said, well, they would be very welcome. And I said, well, now a lot of churches say that, but I expect more. <laughs> and honestly, I got more because Kevin and Louie came in and they were so welcomed. And actually it was a nativity. It was a nativity play, um, Christmas service when they came. And um, they, they didn't have enough um, young people to play the three kings. So Michael was explaining this to Kevin. So Kevin was there and he said, well, you've got two queens here. <laughs> two queens. <laughs> and honestly, they were made so welcome in the church, you know, and um, let me see. So how, what we did was um, um, Changing Attitude Ireland sent out letters to all the churches um, just saying, you know, that they could uh, register with Changing Attitude Ireland. So that means go on a website and then anybody who wants to go to a church will see if they're affirming. So, just for those who don't know, Mary, can you explain what Changing Attitudes Ireland is? Oh, Changing Attitude, well, you can look it up. It's, changing, it's just, it's just um, a group of people who are just trying to um, change the attitude in Ireland in churches to okay. welcome, uh, not to welcome, to affirm um, all LGBTQ people in churches and to get the churches to actually register to, and to make it public that that's yeah. what they are. So okay. that's one of the ways that uh, they, would, they do it. Okay. So uh, Michael had got a letter and it was a vestry meeting and I was just leaving. It was before this, um, it was the end, end one, it was June. And Michael just passed me this letter and, and I read it and I went, wow. And then when we went back in September, I noticed that these letters were all sitting out. Everybody got a copy of them on the table. So everybody got one and went away with it. And when we came back the next, the next meeting, everybody, read, everybody agreed and we registered. And so I registered us with Changing Attitude Ireland. Okay, so that was great. Um, meanwhile, I went to a, um, a women's study fellowship, women's fellowship study course in Belfast Bible College. And um, the college had asked if we would do a little project in church with our rectors or our ministers, just a coffee morning or something help us but all all we had to do is really say a prayer so our uh, rectors also got a letter so michael and i met and i said you know what's about blah 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 and we both looked at each other and we said let's have a party let's celebrate that we have become um affirming in our church and so it just was it was just wonderful and also Michael had been to um, an, an art exhibition I had done in Framework, and that was an art exhibition called Talk to Your Mountain. And that exhibition uh, was challenging and highlighting religious beliefs towards LGBTQ people. So he'd been to that. So he said, bring your paintings, let's have your paintings up. So then I suggested storytelling, music, and, um, and also, um, yes, um, people sharing their, their testimony, and we had tea and buns, and the exhibition, and so it was. It was just great. I mean, we had eighty-eight people there, and but it was also for our congregation. It was for our congregation to come to know what we were doing and to welcome people. So it was about half and half. The congregation all came, and it was just a great, great, great night. And honestly, I can just. I can't say anything, you know, more about Michael. He's just, he is just an exceptional priest. And I mean, we, we don't, um, we, we, we are Church of Ireland, a traditional Church of Ireland. And Michael would be very conscious as well of the older people who know nothing really about the first question I got asked was, what does Q stand for? You know, yeah, yeah. so, um, so they know, but, but Aidan came once a couple of times to the church and we are still just a um a church of ireland um traditional church of ireland um and we don't we wouldn't sort of say we welcome you whoever you are except you know as they come in everybody's just the same hmm. uh but and people don't really then wouldn't be encouraged um in a church service to tell the stories because that's not 
that's not the you know the format of the church. Exactly. Yeah. If there yeah. is if there is a, um, a any references that would be in the Bible to to being affirming, uh, they're always made very clear uh, in a very in a very gentle way. And I must say something else as well. I don't know if Michael's listening to this or not, but you know because because I think when when we when because of the lockdown which started sort of just shortly afterwards, I feel as if um, our church is accepted and embedded as an affirming church. You know, nothing has happened, but it's there and it's embedded. Yep. But, and we got a new bishop, okay? And um, then he came out to see us in the church. There was only four of us there. And he had not been in the church. And so he, Michael brought him through. And one of my paintings is still there. And it was, it's on a big, uh, maybe Jade, you've seen it. It's a big one. <laughs> and we went in there and Michael said, so this, so this is the artist and I'm sort of trying to hide a bit. And then Michael said, so come and tell the story of the painting. And I'm, ah. So I did, I said, it's a legacy of love. And I had written this piece about it and I just read it out and I read out how it depicted my son, um, leaving a church that had um, hurt him and uh, walking towards the light and everything. And as I read it out, I thought, this, this is actually very good. Yeah. <laughs> I said it didn't so well. But the bishop said nothing, not a word. But anyway, I just feel that um, our church is really affirming and it's just accepted like that. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> what I like about your approach, and I really wish more of us could learn from you, is... It wasn't a reluctant sort of, oh, I suppose we better be affirming or take that box or anything. You really mm-hmm. celebrated it and you rejoiced in it, which is how it should be, you know. And um, so if, if people are asking the question, how does a church make clear that it's welcoming and affirming? Have a party. Listen to follow oh, Mary's lead. But first mm-hmm. of all, register with Changing Attitude Ireland. Change, That's a good, yes. Look that up, yes. that website. And once you do that, then you're on the website and anybody who wish, wish to see, you know, we're there. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Mary. We're uh, going to drop you back into the list. And um, thank you for your contribution. Okay, guys. So um, as Mary said there, they're, you know, they're a traditional Church of Ireland. We're a more coming from a new church, Pentecostal sort of background. You know, we're not changing that part of us. I mean, we might change, but... All, you know, it doesn't require a church to become something brand new all of a sudden. You know, you were just not being exclusive. That's the only, only thing. Um, someone, uh, maybe we could just have turned towards a slightly more theological angle here. Um, and anyone can have a go at this one. Uh, so this is from, a, from one of the attendees. He says, uh, lifelong churchgoer and Christian until I came out some years ago. Uh, Since then, I've really struggled with church and having a sense of peace with my faith and sexuality. I sometimes say I feel too gay to be Christian and too Christian to be gay. I want to be in a relationship because I miss companionship so much, but I still have those nagging feelings that I'm bound for hell if I do. So dating has been hard. How do you differentiate between conviction by the Holy Spirit and bad indoctrination? So I guess this is, uh, as the question says, how do people know that their the guilt or the things they're struggling with is just what they've been told and it's wrong and it's unhelpful, or maybe people have been taught to believe that's the Holy Spirit convicting them. How do they know the difference? Who wants to have a go at that question? I'll have a, I can have a punt. <laughs> go ahead, David. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and, um, it's one that I've heard before and I've had before as well. Um, I have come from the background of um, having had a very, what sometimes is called a conservative or traditional worldview on these things from growing up within a Presbyterian church and have gone through a period of gra- grappling with that, with that question. Um, you know, when it comes down to these sorts of theological issues, when it comes to 
trans and um, gay and queer people, it affects our lives. It's not something that you can you know, think a little bit about the theology of and then put away and then go on to something else. It's something that in the end of the day, especially for me when it comes to can you have a relationship with someone of the same sex or not, it becomes, you, you need to come down to an answer for it. So you do have to ask the very tough question of what is actually right. Um, and there's a few things that I would say are helpful to differentiate between those two. One is, is the position that you're holding for whatever reason out of, out of fear? Is it something that is marked by the feelings of feeling guilt and shame? And if it is, then that should be, I think, a trigger to look again. Um, things that I think help come to a view on it that you can be happy with is, can you openly discuss it? Can you question it in a way that is supported by a community that are willing to support you regardless of what answer you come to? And that could be either way. I do know people that have taken a long, hard look at this, what's affected them personally, and at the end of the day, come to decide that a relationship isn't for them for whatever reason. And people that have come down to that it, that it is, um, and the hallmarks of being able to become content with that, I think, is to be in an environment where you can explore it without it openly with other people, where you don't have this sense of guilt and shame around it, and where, regardless of where you come down to, you know that you'll find support. And that, I think that's a hallmark of faith as well. Like, regardless of, you know, theology is complicated and it is constantly evolving and changing, but a hallmark of a really good faith is this openness and this inquiry rather than having everything be shut down and dictated to you. So I think you need to come to it for yourself regardless of where you think that conviction will lie, lies for the, the, the questioner in this, talk to other people um, and talk to people that can be um, supportive and supportive of the questions. Questions are okay. That's yeah, this point. is something that I really care about too. And I love listening to David on this stuff because he is so gracious. Do you know how gracious you are? Um, you're amazing. I feel so uh, so strongly that God delights in us and the glory of God is a person who is fully alive, a person who is experiencing joy, freedom, faith, love, uh, peace, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, all of that stuff. Um, and there is something for me, and this is a big challenge, and I am working this out myself, and I am not there yet in terms of how to get the right wording but I'm really really trying um the we need to relocate this from a sin narrative to a justice narrative that's what has to happen here um we have done some really hard work across the church in terms of uh women and women in leadership uh there's a long way to go and there was another brilliant webinar that Harbour did on that check it out um but we, the church has done some really hard work around that. The church is doing hard work in terms of race and ethnicity, um, hard work around accessibility, and we need to do hard work around this. And the most important thing for me is the idea of a sin narrative. Is it, whatever it is, right or wrong, um, to me is very reductionist and closes this down, whereas a justice narrative looks at while we have a people here who have been treated horrendously, marginalised, excluded, um, lay, you know, really laid out on an operating table and picked at and prodded at. And actually, we as LGBTQ plus people are a gift to the church. And the church does very, very well whenever they recognise that as Harbour experiencing and many others, St Gauls and others. Um, so let's really do some hard work and think about how to relocate this from a sin narrative to a justice narrative. It, I, just to back up what Jade is saying there, I, not many people realize this, but you know the famous altar call? 
that you get in, in, in churches. Um, some people think it's just a Pentecostal thing, but it only started about a hundred years ago. The, the fame of the, you know, uh, iconic altar call, but the, or a you know, hundred years ago, whenever it was, the, the, the first altar calls actually were calls for Christians to become abolitionists. So the anti-slavery movement that was beginning to grow in churches, which was a justice issue, as Jade is saying, they began to call Christians, who wants to come forward to the altar and declare that they are against slavery, right? To become an abolitionist. And so that wasn't anything to do with confessing your sin, except to say maybe the sin of injustice and confessing that and taking strides towards justice, because that's love, that's worship, that's following Jesus, you know? So yeah, you're absolutely right. We sometimes separate those two, th two things, like justice is there and sin and piety and all that's here, but absolutely not, you know, being just, is the same thing, you know, as being, you know, the word righteous and justice, they're the same word in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew. Um, so fascinating there. Anybody else want to say anything on that? Yeah, can I just jump in um, just to kind of, um, because, you know, Jade's saying, you know, the church is doing, and they are doing work, you know, we're gradually getting there with all these sort of topics or issues. I hesitate to use that word. Um, but one thing, and I can speak of this from personal experience, um, is that for someone like myself who's trans, um, churches aren't even looking at that yet. And I appreciate that, yes, it can take a while to wrap their head around sexuality. Um, but when you get someone that's trans, um, you know, I mean, my own personal experience, so I grew up in a Methodist church. I went to this church when I was three years old. So I went there my whole life. And when I started coming out as trans, at that point, I would, was like youth fellowship leader. I was youth club leader. My whole life of all around church. And when I came out, um, the minister was the one who actually told me the spectrum even existed. So thank you to her for that, because she linked me in with that community. But I can remember one night after Bible study, I felt like I was living a double life. Because in church, I was going, I wasn't Aiden. I wasn't myself fully. And I thought, right. I felt compelled to be honest and I thought right well pretty sure I can speak to her about this because she's told me it's spectrum. I remember going and having this conversation with her and I said you're look I know this particular church's policy is that if you're in a same-sex relationship you can't do leadership so they were losing out there was another girl who thankfully has now been reinstated as a GB officer etc because she happens to have a partner who's female but I went into this same meeting and I said to the minister, look, here's the deal. I'm trans. Um, and her response was, um, yeah, and you know, everybody's known that for years. Like, I thought I was keeping it a secret. But the problem came because I said, you're like, I know the church's policy on same-sex couples. What about me? Like, I'm single. But what about someone that's transgender? And the problem was she basically said, look, the church hasn't looked at this, but doesn't matter if you're single or not you can't do leadership you have to step down and I was prepared to stand at the front of that church and go do you know what guys um I'm one of these scary LGBT people that you've heard about you've known me from I was three you have seen this coming years before I've seen it coming I was prepared to stand up in the church and do that I knew there were people in that church who would not have been okay with that and I discussed this with the minister. I wasn't going to do it without her permission. And she felt, you know, I think some people have this perception that church leaders don't know or they don't care. But she cared because we sat and cried because she said, look, I can't let you do that for your own safety. So it wasn't that she wasn't willing to give me the space or let me be myself. She's like, no, no, it doesn't matter. You've came here from you were very small. People will literally grab you there and then and throw you out the door of that church. And as someone that's trans, I think, you know, it's great the churches are making steps towards um, being inclusive with sexuality and whether people's view is you have to be celibate or you can be in the same relationship, but you have to remember in that conversation, there has to be trans people as well. Because the other thing people forget about trans people is we have sexualities too. So um, I think just highlighting that and saying that a church you know it wasn't until I asked the minister until I asked the question what is your policy on this and even the fact there has to be a policy you know this whole written down formal thing agreed upon by everybody 
about a person and what they can do within that building and those organizations. Um, so just kind of for churches, you know, as much as it can be hard for them, please literally spell it out because, you know, it, it makes it abundantly clear, not only to someone like me who's been there for a while, but anybody walking in the door, you know, they don't have to ask those awkward questions. Um, unfortunately, the upshot of that was I had to just leave that church. I just left, um, didn't say goodbye to anybody. I just disappeared. Um, thankfully, I've been able to go back. Um, I don't know if they've looked at it. Um, they're certainly getting there with sexuality. Um, but just, you know, kind of don't forget about the trans people. Um, churches is brilliant. They're saying, yay, we support gay and lesbian Christians. But there's trans Christians. There's asexual Christians. There's non-binary Christians. There's, like, every single, you know, person you can imagine in the LGBT community could be a Christian. Um, so while it's great that with sexuality, there's a focus there. It's being talked about. Please don't forget about the rest of us because um, it can make it really hard for a trans person I know walking into a new church and going right I know you accept gay Christians but what about me because yeah. it's a totally different ball game with gender. Yes I, I completely hear you Aiden and that, that often that is an issue you, you know transgender um, persons are sort of a minority within a minority group you know sometimes that, that's how it's seen and uh, yeah, there's, there's not enough conversation. And one of the questions I had here was, was actually to ask, are there issues related specifically to transgender uh, persons that you think churches need to be aware of? And maybe Sarah, um, we could come in on that one. You, I take it you can relate to what Aidan has said there, and maybe you could help us think about um, issues re related specifically to trans people of faith that you think churches should be aware of? Yeah, no, I think really well said. <laughs> really well Thanks. said, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and I, I think you know it, when I when I first started kind of going to churches after transition, it, I didn't have kind of massively high expectations really. You know, I kind of think, you know, there are some things that they can that churches can do that kind of go beyond this. But actually, I guess I was going just hoping for the basics really, hoping that you know I could use whatever kind of toilet I wanted to use, that you know I could dress in whatever way I could I wanted to dress, that people would you know, choose to use the pronouns that I want them to use, you know, that to me, that kind of stuff is not difficult stuff to do yeah. at all, particularly. I know there are challenges for some people around that, but, you know, that, that type of thing and, you know, where there is, you know, things like Trans Day of Remembrance kind of be, being willing to remember that type of stuff and, yes. you know, be aware of what's going on. You know, I've, I've been at church at times when massive stuff has been going on in the kind of backdrop um, politically and, you know, kind of there are some really difficult things for trans people going on at the moment. Um, and just being aware of that and kind of acknowledging that when I've, when I've said to, you know, because uh, the place I go, they, they're very, um, they're, they're quite socially justice orientated. So they kind of will, they will address that often in, in sermons. And I have kind of said in the past, why, why was that topic not kind of even mentioned? So actually kind of call it, calling that out. So that I think, you know, but those are some of the kind of basics things do. But I think the heartbreaking thing that Aidan was talking about is actually that, you know, that you go into, into churches and can't feel like you can actually participate in the way that everyone else can participate. That the moment you, um, you know, that they realise there's something different, that actually that limits the amount of contribution you can make to the church. And I think, you know, there are the basics that need to be done, but I think also taking that next step and kind of allowing allowing <laughs> um, it's the wrong <laughs> it feels insulting to say I should be allowed to do that but anyway yeah. um yeah. but kind of being able to kind of um take opportunities to kind of to lead to help run groups to be part of you know leadership teams of groups um and actually welcoming that kind of you know that actually there's a it always used to kind of make me laugh that you know my kind of professional life the amount of stuff that I can do that kind of exceeds, you know, what I would ever be able to do in church because I'm not allowed to do that. It's just a bizarre, yeah. kind of a bizarre situation to be in. And so actually recognising that there are kind of, there are capabilities there, there are things that, that trans people can contribute to it and allowing them to kind of be open to allowing them to do that is, I think is, you know, it's got to be pushed beyond just the basics. But hey, if you do the basics, we'll be at least happy that you've done the basics yeah. for us. And thank you. Yeah. Well, to, speaking of the basics, can I ask a, a basic question? So for, for Sarah and for Aidan, um, some people are just 
scared about saying the wrong thing or using inappropriate language. They want to be helpful and inclusive, but they're, they're a bit reluctant. How helpful is it? Is it a helpful thing um, when someone meets someone who is trans to ask the question, what is your preferred pronoun? What's your, what's your preferred gender pronoun? Or does that, is that an uncomfortable conversation to have for you? Or is that a basic conversation you'd like to have with, with new people? Um, I would say don't just ask that to trans people because okay. you are singling somebody out. The fact, you know, um, if somebody came up to me and they never met me and they were like, what's your pronouns? You do, I honestly, because especially I'm, I haven't medically transitioned at all yet. Um, I've been on an NHS waiting list for three years, which is likely to get a lot longer, unfortunately. Um, so when people first meet me, especially when I start speaking, um, they might look at me and think, oh, that's a guy. And then I open my voice, you know, I open my the voice comes out and they're like, mm, what? But for someone to ask that question, um, what pronouns, it takes a lot of the awkwardness out of it. I know from personal experience that there's times I'll meet someone and you have to train yourself to do it because people don't normally do it. You know, we're trained that you look at someone and you just decide, oh, yeah. they're a girl or they're a guy based on what they're wearing or how they appear, how they express themselves. But having that question asked, it's helpful because if somebody misgenders me and says, oh, she, I will never, ever jump in and go, actually, it's he. Yeah. Like, I literally don't have the guts to do that. And I will just sit there quietly and sort of go with it. The fact you ask that question is also a big indicator for me as a trans person that, okay, either you're trans yourself, so I know I'm safe with you, or you've previously encountered someone that's trans and you you know what you're doing sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, and I think just normalizing it, you know, okay, don't ask it of every single person you ask, but kind of try to make it a normal thing. If, if you're not sure, or if you're not sure, just refer to somebody with they them you know a neutral pronoun until you're sure okay. um and it makes it a lot easier um for the trans you know for someone that's trans if you don't know just ask you know we're not gonna turn around and be like well how did you not tell i was a guy or a girl or whatever you know you're better asking if you're not sure if the person turns around and goes what do you mean my pronouns are this then oh sorry they're probably not trans right. um but we really would appreciate it you know okay all right, Sarah, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I think, I mean, I know some people who, you know, I guess, you know, in talking to Aidan and I, you're kind of getting um, one kind of view of the trans world, because I would totally agree with you, Aidan. And I think that, you know, there are some trans people who would be mortally kind of, um, they would really find that really very hard. Because because of the reason you described that if someone said, what's your pronouns, they would feel like they've been read. Um, right. as kind of as not the gender they're kind of project they're they're trying to kind of um portray themselves as okay. um and so it's kind of i think that some people would find that quite quite difficult but i think you know when you're in that kind of context and certainly for me i'm five foot eleven and i'm quite kind of broad and actually i know that kind of i people recognize that i'm trans and so you know i actually i, I genuinely don't mind people asking not just that but you know what pronouns i want to use but I'm really happy to kind of talk to them about my experiences. And I think a lot of people are kind of in that position of, of being willing to do that. I think there are some people who, you know, get kind of education fatigue. So they kind of just, you know, kind of grasp that a huge amount and it does get kind of tiresome. Um, but I think most trans people are willing to have a, you know, not just to answer that question, but answer a little bit more and, and inform people a little bit about it as well. Um, no, so I think I think kind of go with it if you you know if you're really unsure, then kind of then go with it. The person's probably more used to it. If you're if you're really really not sure because they're really kind of then I, you know I I maybe think twice about it. I don't know what you think, Aiden, with that because I'm sure you've met people who have kind of who would be who would find that really hard if people kind mm -hmm. of did say ask them that question. Um, yeah. I don't think it's, it's, it's a really, I can see why people are, find it difficult because I don't think it's a, a really clear kind of, uh, there's not, it's not possible to give you a really clear answer on it because I think, yeah. you know, there's so many trans people who are different in the way they, mm. way they would react to that question. But that's the thing, you know, love, love is difficult and complicated and it takes work, but that's the point of it, you know, and, and I guess we're, if we're all willing to be sensitive, to listen, to not be afraid, to not be afraid to take offense even, um, we, we'll get there. Um, so that's, that's very helpful. 
Um, thank you for that. Um, just speaking about your identity as trans or as gay or as bisexual, um, I know that's, I mean, obviously for everyone, your sexuality is only a part of who you are, what makes you who you are. Do you get fed up with that being the main thing about you that, that people are always curious about? I mean, people just put the LGBT community together as if it's all one big happily fa happy family. And uh, does, it, does it bother you at times that you wish people could see that there's more to you than your sexuality or your gender and you just would rather it was uh, t it took a back seat for once. I know it's hard. I know I'm putting you on the spot right now and I'm, you're, you're on the webinar for that reason. And, but does that get annoying? Um, something that I find really interesting about this is Sarah used the, the terminology there about how we are read. And quite often people will read me as heterosexual. Um, and there was a bit of a journey for me personally around not just sitting with that, do you know? Um, and it, it really went from, I suppose, a space where, quite honestly, I, at one point in my life, I was reasonably happy with that because I could just sort of slip under the radar a little bit. And I've moved from that place to a place where I am delighted by my sexuality. I love it. I think there is such unique experience that I have gained um, through having the experiences and the feelings and the thoughts and the conversations that I have had as a result of it. Um, so I am now at the stage where I really, really celebrate my sexuality as a major part of who I am. What I find frustrating is whenever people will approach with a sense of um, a sense of inquisition. I think that actually what they're asking me uh, isn't really, for example, about my feelings or my relationship or my well-being or how I am, but it's actually what do you do in bed? Can we discuss if it's right or wrong? Um, in fact, I'm probably just going to tell you what I think about whether it's right or wrong, and that is invasive and entirely inappropriate. Um, and yes, in that sense, it's very reductionist because, you know, talk to me about the poetry I've written about it or talk to me about the songs that I like as well. Um, but I do really, really love my sexuality. I love that part of my identity now, but I didn't always. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I think that um, for me now, it, it, it's because of a lot of the support I have and place that I'm in, it's it's one of the many aspects that mix up me and it's not something that I constantly get asked about, which I appreciate is a privilege in itself that not um, everybody who is LGBTQ um, has all the time. I, I just think that that's such a great point that Jade made at the end there that I just wanted to jump on, the idea of we're talking a lot about creating spaces where um, people can tell their stories, which is genuinely wonderful. I think one of the most empowering things you can do is to give someone that place where they can be listened to. But it's so important that you don't demand someone's story from them. Mm -hmm. And that's something that took me a while to learn because when I first came out, I got really passionate about, I want to talk to people about this. I want to like, go to loads of places and tell my story and start to get people to reconcile over this. That was something I wanted to do. But when that's demanded of someone, when you're constantly being asked, what's your view on X, Y, and Z, even when it's quite benign and it is, you know, out of curiosity, and sometimes it is like what Jade said, it's more, it can be a bit more sinister and can be a bit more, you know, defend yourself, you know, tell me all the theology that makes you think it's okay that you have mm. um, a male partner, you know, and that's something that I learned from um, a good friend and the uh, previous leader of the Kormila community um, that um, some of us know here, um, Padre Gotoma, was that idea of you don't have to always defend yourself. People shouldn't demand you to defend yourself your opinions 
especially where you know it comes to the theology of it you should be able to be in a space and breathe and that's also a sign of somewhere that's truly what we were talking about earlier truly affirming is a place where you can sit and breathe and be yourself it's great to be asked your story but it's not good to be demanded tell me all the answers and if you can't if you don't have a theology degree level where are the answers that i can run rings around your arguments then you can't be here no you should allow people to be somewhere to ask the questions to just be able to breathe and it not be the first thing that's always said so um i'm lucky that it often it often isn't the first thing that comes that comes up mm. but you yeah. should never make it yeah yeah okay okay um what are some uh, good slash helpful practices that you have found within faith contexts um, that you've that you've personally experienced um, that, that you are happy to talk about? So, for you, anything that you've encountered, experience that you have found helpful in knowing that you're welcome and just being part of the faith community, that anybody wants to share? Not many helpful things out there. <laughs> Many, many helpful things. I just didn't want to take up too much airtime. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I um, have a few specific examples that always come come to mind. And especially one thing that I often think about is if you're coming at things from a perspective of, like the person who sent a, a question in earlier, that you're not sure what you think about it or you come from a different perspective where it doesn't match with your worldview um, um, and how you then enter dialogue with people who have these experiences with people who are LGBTQ, right? So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're someone who's more conservative, it's a harder conversation to sometimes have because of where you're coming from. And I have a couple examples of where that was done really well. Okay. Um, so um, one was a friend who, when I was on my journey of looking into it and deciding what I felt was right about um, relationships, and we then came to two different viewpoints, um, where I thought that the thing that was authentically Christian was to celebrate same-sex relationships, and they thought what was authentically Christian was to say that it's not right. And so we came to this loggerhead. And we used to be the sort of people that would argue with each other about everything all the time. It's what we enjoyed to do. Um, but what he said to me in that moment was, just because you think something different from me doesn't mean you're wrong, right? So they, he, he flipped it around to say that it was just a lot of humility that I wasn't expecting. And um, that to acknowledge that the person you're talking to may be right and you may be wrong. And actually that simple admission can make a big difference. And the other one to that was, again, someone that was maybe coming from things from a more traditional point of view, giving that time to listen and to build up a relationship. And that was over months and months and months of not just arguing, but just actually listening, going through that journey of looking at it together. Um, and that was something that was really helpful. So specifically from, if you're coming at things from a more conservative point of view, listen and give that ground that you might be wrong and you'll make friends. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. So listening, being willing to admit you might be wrong, all that's, and I suppose that's, that's helpful in many uh, situations, not just this conversation. Um, okay. Quick, quick round of uh, something um, biblical here. Um, churches like ours, um, those who try and be um, uh, allies, to LGBT people of faith and just the LGBT community, churches that have, are welcoming and affirming, are often accused of having simply caved to culture and you've thrown the Bible out, you're just ignoring what it says, and all you're doing is going along with this new politically correct culture that we're in. And that's often the challenge that's laid at our door, at churches' doors who are affirming. What do you think should be our response to that? Or what, what would you say about that situation? Okay, I'll jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that my first reactionary thought there, Steve, to what you have said is, gosh, let's celebrate that God is creative and dreamt all of us up 
we are masterpieces. We are um, true, truly works of art, gifts to the church. God is wide and beautiful and we see that reflected in the the wideness the broadness the diversity the creativity in humanity um, the idea that lgbtq plus people all of a sudden exist is obviously again a very reductionist view we have always existed um, and the idea that this is some sort of you know popular culture movement or trend um, is an insult that is an insult so I think that what I would say to that is I have actually seen um, in my experience of churches that are celebratory and affirming of LGBTQ plus people and other minorities as well. I have found a depth of theology that I have not found in churches where um, there is a black and white narrow view. I have found exploration of scripture. I have seen scripture taken much more seriously, if I'm honest. Um, in the likes of Harbour, where there is real discussion, exploration, theological conversations. Um, so I think it's the complete opposite. I don't think there's any caving about it. I think it is hard work being done. I think it is a journey of faith. Um, I think it's honouring to God, much, much more honouring than a black and white, um, very closed view. Yeah, I, I can totally support what you're saying for sure. That's been my experience too churches and faith leaders who've come to the position of being affirming have uh, done so through real scrutiny of scripture and wrestling with texts and wrestling with the faith. They've not thrown it out at all. If anything, they're taking it way more seriously. That's been my journey. That's been our journey as a church. That's what I've seen. Um, so if you do hear that or you're worried about that, if anyone's worried about that accusation, it, it, as Jade says, she's right. It's the complete opposite. Um, you, you can take your Bible seriously and, and that doesn't mean that you have to then be exclusive at all. It's, it's just the opposite. And there are, that's a whole other discussion we could have. Um, anybody else want to jump in on that or? Yeah, I just, we... I was quite interested in um, while, where I think it's been put most compellingly um, is in um, Vicki Beeching's um, book, you know, mm. the undivided book. Mm. I think she has a chapter where she's kind of going through the things that the church has kind of capitulated about over history, like, slavery like how it brings women to you know that where you've kind of had periods where actually this the the scripture has been used to justify kind of really deeply inappropriate kind of cultural things and yet you know just a few years later actually that's that's gone and, and everyone's rejoicing that it's gone and i just think that this is the next phase of that and that in in a few years to come people will it won't be a cultural capitulation it will be a thank goodness we saw the light and we exactly. we kind of we we moved in that way yeah that's well put i mean if you if you want to su support racist views that's that's your inclination you could find scriptures that will support you in doing so if you wanted to if you uh, wanted to be exclusive of a certain group of people and you, and you looked hard enough and you could find them. If you wanted to be supportive of the idea of slavery, as many people did, as you, as you point out, you can find really robust scriptures that will seem to support that view. But now we look back and go, well, that's an ab obviously ab abhorrent, you know, and I think you're right. We will, many of us look back and go, how did we ever get that so wrong? All reading the same Bible, but coming to, as we tend to do over the centuries, just, just different, different views. And if anyone's unsure, I always suggest err on the side of grace, love, and inclusion, right? Much rather be wrong doing that than being exclusive and horrible and making people hurt. Um, because if they're wrong about that, the consequences are severe for lots of people. And we all know too well what those are. Um, okay, we're coming very swiftly and rapidly towards a close. Um, it, again, as always with these, uh, webinars I could go on for for ages, but yeah, two two quick questions to to close. First of all, from you uh, for personally, have you ever felt celebrated? Have you, as a person, as an LGBT person of faith, felt celebrated within a faith context? And it's okay if the answer is no. Just just honestly, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> is the honest answer. Oh, Thank you, Sarah. We were talking about this before. There are loads and loads of words that I would use to um, 
to say how the church has, as you know, positive words that the church has, you know, I would use to describe how my church has, has treated me. So things like, you know, I feel accepted there. I feel I belong there. I feel I feel loved there. They praise me for the things that I do and the things that I contribute. But I loved the idea. I think someone should throw a party for me. I think that's kind of that's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I loved that story. So yeah, that I, I mean, it's difficult to know what kind of being celebrated kind of means in in that sense because I've got a fairly kind of vivid imagination. Um, <laughs> but actually, kind of, um, I do think that no, I, I don't feel like I've been celebrated. But they've got as near as they possibly could without literally throwing a party. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anybody else? I would say yes. Um... Although it's a bit of a weird one, um, and a lot of people here would say church is in the building, and it really isn't. One of the times I felt the most celebrated is at Belfast Pride, um, when I've been walking as part of Christians at Pride, which gets bigger and bigger every year. So there's a bunch of us go in the Pride Parade with our purple t-shirts on, I just says Christians at Pride, and it's just to show other people that we're here. And I can remember, it was actually my first Pride in 2017, and I went along with them. And I can remember walking past City Hall. And City Hall is where we get our protesters, so our people who have the big placards up saying, you know, you're going to hell, it's all sinful, and all the usual Bible verses they took at us. And it was the first year Christians of Pride ever walked in Belfast um, Pride. And as we went past, we got the biggest cheer. And I remember we got all the way around City Hall and we got stopped because it stops and starts with so many people. And there was a lady actually turned around to me and there were so many people as we were walking. I think they first thought we were protesters in the parade and they were like, why they let them in? But as people realised who we were and why we were there, so many people were like cheering us on. And there was one lady in particular, I remember, actually said you guys are so brave because you're putting targets on your backs and you know that's what you're doing and walking around and people's reaction people saying thank goodness somebody you know and these are people who I would reckon you know they didn't put it as mildly as that shall we say um probably didn't go to church but they were like thank goodness somebody's getting it um and somebody you know all we were doing was walking around carrying a banner we weren't chanting stuff we weren't handing stuff out we were just physically being there and first pride's a big thing anyways but to be part of that as christians at pride um and even for me in particular as a trans guy i had a trans flag so i'm only five foot one and my trans flag is five foot three so the only way i can wear to pride is to tie it around my neck like a superhero cape and i was walking around and even hearing these voices from the crowd going, oh, there's a trans guy, there's a trans Christian, you know, even that, um, just being part of that whole thing was amazing. And it was the general public's reaction. It wasn't church people reacting to us. It was just the general public who were like, we've got hope. Somebody gets it. This is amazing. You know, it was seeing their reaction um, felt so celebrated. And I would count that as within a faith context. Um, Because for me, at the end of the day, um, I could see God there. People would say, you know, well, God's just in a church. But these random people who were not putting it so politely, you know, it is Belfast. There's a bit of, you know, a bit of swearing stuff going on in the middle of it. But just seeing that um, spoke to me so much more um, and made me feel so much celebrated, not just as a trans guy, as an asexual trans guy, as an LGBT plus person but also as a christian as part of that and this is people that as far as i'm aware weren't christians you know which i think says a lot in itself yeah and that is so beautiful i wish i could transport myself through the screen and throw my <laughs> arms around you um oh wonderful uh, i'm gonna embarrass you steve now because or maybe i won't embarrass you maybe you'll love it <laughs> um whenever i had heard of harbour i was in uh i was within the role in diverse church where i was leading the northern ireland sort of part and i really had it in my heart that there were so many people myself included and so many others who for some reason despite being trampled upon time and time and again really wanted to find a, a faith community where they could be fully themselves and i put Steve through the mill. I, I mean, I remember it and I refer back to it often. 
Um, and I said, you know, you've, you've kind of come out and you've put your, tied your colors to the mast and you've said on social media that you're inclusive and you've put all this information up. Um, and now I'm going to find the way that you're not. <laughs> Remember and, that. I, <laughs> yeah. and I sort of said, you know, I'm going to find the line because there's always a line. And I went through it and through it and through it. And I asked about leadership and asked about marriage and just all sorts of stuff and was really encouraged by what I heard. And then as time went on, I still was very skeptical, as you know, Steve. Um, but as time went on, I just saw this absolutely in practice. And the thing that really made me feel celebrated was it wasn't that Harbour felt charitable to me. Hmm. Harbour did not feel charitable to allow me to be included. Harbour felt absolutely over the moon delighted to have me hmm. and others. Um, and, you know, Steve always has this little line of, gosh, we need all the help we can get. Um, so it wasn't a case of, you know, we will allow you to give out communion or we will allow you to be a leader. It was, oh, my goodness, we would be so lucky. Would you, would you consider that? That would really be amazing for us as a church. Um, so that is the celebration for me yeah it's, well it's, it's hard to get the staff you know so as as you say any any, any all hands on deck as we say in harbor but uh, no, that's, uh that's, Steve, that's i was, go, I was go going to embarrass you as well <laughs> um uh you probably don't remember this but there was one point you know to have a leader in your church sort of bound up to you when they've heard that you've had like a first date with um, your boyfriend and just to be very openly and very excited just to get all the gloss and see how it went. Just something very run of the mill and just leaving that just every day, every day thing. And just that felt, it just felt normal and lovely and just a community. And that would probably be, for me personally, that would probably be more than a big party. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, just that, uh, just that. Uh, so it's not difficult things. It's the small human things done genuinely and well and consistently. Yeah. Know? Yeah. That, I mean, I really think more, more church leaders and churches just need to hear that, that no one's asking for monumental efforts and huge changes in theology. We're just asking to be as Jesus was loving kind and, and, and acknowledge that we all need help and that this is a hard task we all have, you know, bringing the, the labors are few and the harvest is plentiful. So why would we want to cut off any laborers, you know, and that just keeping everything normal is, um, is yeah, celebration enough. We're okay. We're already on five minutes past nine. So I'm going to draw to a close instead of, I mean, I'm very grateful to all you guys um, for, for sharing. I'm actually going to use the words. Someone has put something in the chat here and it's not a question, but it's directed to all panelists. So I'm going to finish with these words. Sorry if I didn't get to your question and you have a question, um, but we are out of time. So this is from Helen, uh, Helena, Helena, to, to all of you guys. Uh, just to say a huge thank you to everyone involved. Such an important conversation. Thanks to everyone for contributing and sharing. Now in my mid 40s, but I grew up in Northern Ireland. I had, in brackets, still have a number of good friends who are LGBTQ plus and a number of whom are raised in church and or had faith. Sadly, pretty much all of them have left the church and many left the North in order to live freely as themselves. So it's really encouraging to see that some things have changed in the North. And sadly, I see younger people now still having some of these same problems. But it's great to see that there are churches, Spectrum, Diverse Church, etc. there. Thank you. It's great to see my teens grow up and have friends who are gay, trans, non-binary, and that be very normal. And I'd love to see that more in a church context. Feeling proud of you all. So I couldn't have put it better myself. Thank you for that comment. And thank you to everyone else for being here. Hope that was helpful. And um, we'll let you know when the next chat is coming up. Signing off for now. Grace and peace to you all. Thanks, guys.